Hello everyone, Victor is here, your guide to all things organic chemistry, and today I want to talk about this mechanism. So this seems to be a very straightforward reaction. We take our nucleophile, we do the substitution here via the SN2 style, and we are done, right? Cool. Is that a reasonable mechanism? That is absolutely reasonable mechanism for this reaction. Is that a correct mechanism? Well, that is a very different question, because no, that is actually not a correct mechanism for this reaction, so let's talk about why it is not a correct mechanism and how do we know that. So all the mechanisms that we normally teach to you guys in class or stuff that you read in your textbook, etc., we didn't just pull those mechanisms out of thin air. There is a body of research that tells us that certain mechanism works this or that way, and we have different ways how to prove those mechanisms. So if we take this reaction of epichlorohydrine with my cyanide and uh, do the synthesis with that or do this reaction, yeah, we are indeed going to get the product that I have on the screen. But what if I modify my starting material a little bit? What if I take the atom where my chlorine is and replace the hydrogens on that atom with deuteriums? Deuterium is the same thing as hydrogen, so chemically speaking, deuterium is just heavy hydrogen. So the only difference that we have between deuterium and hydrogen is that deuterium has an extra neutron. From the chemical perspective, though, deuterium is pretty much indistinguishable from hydrogen, it does all the same reactions. So here, there is no uh, reason for us to assume that by placing deuteriums in our molecule, we somehow change the reactivity of this molecule. However, the beauty of deuterium is that we can trace that. Since this is a different isotope, we can trace that using the uh, different spectroscopic techniques. One of the most common ones is going to be NMR. Deuterium is invisible in NMR, and because of that, we can say exactly where the deuterium is in our molecule. So if we take this deuterated version of our molecule and we subject that to the same reaction conditions, namely we react it with our sodium cyanide again, then the product that we are going to get is going to look like this. And this is where we have a problem right away. Because if our reaction worked in the SN2 style like we initially proposed, the deuteriums, they should have been sitting on this carbon, and they are not. And the only way how we can make those deuterians move around is, well, to have a different mechanism. So what actually happens there is that our cyanide, instead of attacking the atom with the chlorine, is going to attack the carbon of our epoxide, opening the epoxide ring giving us a negatively charged intermediate that looks like that. Then, from this point, the O- that I have over here, that is a good nucleophile, and we have an electrophilic carbon with our chlorine, so now my nucleophile can react with the electrophile intramolecularly like that, replacing my chlorine and giving my final product like this. So it looks like my cyanide just replaced the chlorine, but in reality, cyanide opened the epoxide and then the epoxide was reformed during this reaction on a different side of the molecule. And this is generally how reactions of epoxides are going to work when we have a competition between the epoxide opening and the regular SN2 reaction. Pretty much in every single case when you have a competition between those, open the epoxide rather than a simple SN2 reaction. There are of course cases where it doesn't work, but in the majority of cases, epoxide will open before the SN2 reaction. So for instance, if I took something like this as my starting material, then in this case cyanide is going to open my epoxide faster than the reaction with the uh, carbon containing the chlorine, giving me an intermediate that looks like that, and this intermediate again can react intramolecularly, displacing the chlorine and making a ring. In this case, it's going to be a one, two, three, four, five, six-membered ring with an oxygen, and my final product will look like this. So as you can see, epoxides are super reactive, and there is a reason why we separate those into an unique functional group, rather than just uh, clumping them up together with other ethers or cyclic ethers or something like that. The epoxides are very unique and very reactive, and because of that, they are, well, a unique functional group. So what did you guys think about this simple yet not so simple reaction? Let me know in the comments below. And of course, if you learned something new today, hit the like button and share this video with your friends and classmates to help promote it and help more students see it. Leave your questions and feedback in the comments below, subscribe to the channel for daily organic chemistry updates, watch this video next, and I will see you tomorrow!